Look, Mr. Bubbles, it's an angel. Alright guys, we don't really have time for an intro today. This is basically going to be two reviews in one, so let's get right into it. Here is my review of Bioshock The Collection for the Nintendo Switch. The story of the Bioshock series, and really just the series in general, is divided into two parts. You've got Bioshocks 1 and 2 that take place in the underwater city of Rapture, created to get away from the rules and moral obligations of society resulting in a lot of different things than what you would see on the surface, like the substance known as Atom that gives people special abilities, all tied together with the strange little sisters that wander Rapture collecting Atom and their hulky, mechanized Big Daddy protectors. In Bioshock 1, you play as the survivor of a plane crash in the late 50s who ends up in Rapture trying to help others escape the ruined and overrun city. Then we get to Bioshock 2, which takes place in the 60s, and in that game, you play as a big daddy who's wandering around Rapture trying to find his lost little sister. The story of these first two games really focuses on the horror-like atmosphere and just the overall setting of Rapture as a city. It's got a lot of really nice psychological and just really disturbing elements as you wander around the city and collect different audio tapes to learn what happened there. And then we get to Bioshock Infinite, which for a long time doesn't really feel like it's part of the same series. Being set in 1912, a good 40-some years before the events of the first game, it takes place in a city high up in the sky where a man travels there to rescue a girl who's been imprisoned for most of her life. But being different doesn't make it a bad story. In fact, Infinite has even more story than the original games had, and the story really excels between the dynamic of the main character and Elizabeth, who is an extremely likable and charismatic character. When it comes to gameplay, this is a collection of first-person shooting games with some exploration and puzzle elements thrown into the mix. Now, being a part of the collection, this means that all of the multiplayer aspects of Bioshock 2 have been removed, and all single-player DLC is built into all three games, all the way to the Burial at Sea expansion for Infinite that ties it to the events of Bioshock 1. Now, before we dive into the games themselves, let's clear up a misconception I've seen in several areas of the Switch community. When you boot these games up and you're connected to Wi-Fi, they try to connect to the 2K servers. A lot of people mistook this as you can't play the games at all, and this is just like what happened with Dooms 1 and 2 before they were patched. Fortunately, that's not the case. If you boot the game up while in airplane mode, it doesn't even try to connect to the servers. And when you turn on airplane mode mid-game, it just gives you a little message that says, hey, we can't connect to the 2K servers, and it lets you right back in to continue doing what you're doing. Now let's dive into progression, which I'm going to divide into two sections. Bioshock 1 and 2, and then Infinite, because they're very different games. In Bioshocks 1 and 2, they are of course first-person shooters with a lot of exploration and puzzle solving involved. Across both of these games, you're going to be wandering through the dark, ruined hallways of the City of Rapture, pushed forward by story and constantly fighting off enemies in the form of human-based slicers, along with the big daddies that accompany Little Sisters. To combat all these threats, you can shoot at enemies with firearms along with using plasmid abilities that you can find and upgrade across the game, basically letting you use superhuman powers like shooting fire out of your hands or throwing objects with telekinesis. Though it's worth noting that combat isn't really the biggest focus of Bioshocks 1 and 2. You will be fighting enemies, but you'll also be solving puzzles with your plasmids and diving into the little sister and morality system that will affect how the game ends. In almost every level of these games, you will find a little sister accompanied by her big daddy. Your task is to defeat the big daddy and capture the little sister. You're then presented with a choice. Harvest and kill the little sister to get a ton of currency you need for upgrades, or rescue and let them go to get a smaller amount of that currency. Essentially, it is a moral choice. If you rescue them, you will get a better ending, but you won't be able to buy as many upgrades. And if you harvest them, you'll get a worse ending, but you'll get more of those upgrades. And although these systems are pretty much the same between Bioshocks 1 and 2, there were some significant improvements between the two games. Whenever you go to a vending machine or a turret and hack it, Bioshock 1 had you going on this little pipe grid system that, without proper upgrades, could easily lock you out of being able to solve the puzzle. Whereas Bioshock 2 completely changed the hacking system to a little minigame that's much easier to accomplish. 
and the combat is also different between the two games. In the first game, you're heavily using firearms and having to switch back and forth between firearms and plasmids, but Bioshock 2 made this a little bit easier, giving you the ability to wield a weapon and a plasmid at the same time. That way, you didn't have to constantly switch back and forth between the two modes. And the only other thing I'll say about the first two games is the fact that the controls in Bioshock 1 feel very stiff. They don't flow nearly as well, and it took me a lot of tweaking in the sensitivity settings, plus the fact that the Bioshock games do not have gyro aiming, to find a really good, comfortable spot as I played through it. And then we get to Bioshock Infinite, which is pretty much the polar opposite of the other two games. Instead of dark, gritty, ruined environments, you've got huge, open, bright environments in this city in the middle of the sky. While it does use many of the same systems, like using guns and special elemental abilities for combat, it also made a lot of changes. To cite some examples, you now have a rechargeable shield like you would see in games like Halo. You can only carry two guns at a time instead of all of the different ones you find across the game, and has a much bigger focus on fighting waves of enemies than set ones wandering around the environment. There's also the dynamic of Elizabeth being with you for most of the game that gives it kind of like a co-op feel, but not co-op. She's following you around, giving you tips and advice on what kind of enemies are going into the area, along with finding money and ammo that she can toss to you in mid-combat. The combat itself is also much more fast-paced, chaotic, and combines gunplay with platforming with all of the sky rails that you can jump on to ride around the stage with. And the more I played Infinite with the different setting, the different types of combat, the different feel, it honestly felt like Bioshock, but it didn't feel like Bioshock because it was such a different type of formula. Although when it came out, a lot of fans could argue that that's exactly what the series needed. Many people didn't like Bioshock 2 and felt it was more of a rehash than a new game. Now, all of these different gameplay systems and games really come together to have a lot of content. Although Bioshock 2 is missing its multiplayer, each of the games is going to take you about 8 to 10 hours to clear, not counting the DLC expansions. So buying this collection is going to give you at least 30 to 40 hours of gameplay, if not more. And now let's dive into presentation, which is absolutely fantastic. There is a light blur on the games, especially in handheld mode, and aiming down the sights definitely intensifies this blur on the weapons themselves in Bioshocks 2 and Infinite, but overall, all three games look great. That's not to say the presentation doesn't have any problems. Bioshock 2 has a tendency to cut its own audio off when you're listening to conversations that multiple people are taking a part of. Many parts about halfway through the game, I've missed a lot of dialogue on, as one statement started and it got a couple words in before the next one completely cut it off and responded to it. And since I don't have any complaints regarding performance, as all of the games play really nicely in both docked and handheld modes, now let's dive into battery life. Now I'm going to pin the full stats in a comment below the review because it would take too long in this video to go through all the stats for all three games. But to be a little general about it, the original model has about a battery range of 2-4 to four hours for this collection. The Nintendo Switch Lite has a range of about 3-5 to five hours, and the V2 has a range of about 4-6 to six hours. Now, in conclusion, the Bioshock Trilogy comes to the Switch in top form. Now, on the downside, Bioshock 1's controls do take some adjusting, and there is a good bit of blur on the weapons when aiming down the sights in the second and third games. But anybody who wants great atmospheric shooters on the go would be hard-pressed to find much better. Reviews to Go rates up the Bioshock Collection for the Nintendo Switch an 8.5 out of 10. If you have any comments or questions, feel free to leave them below. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.